Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Permit, permit me to celebrate the ED of the house, um, the indefatigable pastor. I like the Nigerian accent now. Pastor Fee and the wife, God bless you so much. Um, the entire pastorate, I salute you. The coordination team for Eli Mawa, God bless you. Pastor Josh, Abna, Pastor D, Bishop Fred. Glory and grace, yeah, December is coming. Hey, this is your anointing there. We cannot wait to experience you in full gear at heaven on earth. Um, we are coming to drink from your sisters. Glory and grace, yeah. God bless you so much. And before I minister, I just want to celebrate a very beloved daughter. I've not seen her in one year, heard her voice in one year, but today I see that she's online. Hello, Lami. Lami, please unmute and say hi. Hello, Hillary. It's even possible she's at work and she's still trying to listen. Danny, good to see you. We'll talk behind the scenes. Hallelujah. General Kevin, God bless you so much for your brief introduction. Today, I'm all excited because, I mean, December is here. And when December is here, you know that it's, it's, it's exciting. Heaven on earth is just at the corner and it's going to be super lovely. Hallelujah. Um, also because today we are ending the series on another, and then we would have our last service next week, God willing. So today we are ending a series on another, and it's my, my, my responsibility to show you how to stay humble, because for three weeks I've been speaking about humility. Now we get to the practical application stage how to stay humble. I assured the house I am. I was going to do that. And yes, I'm going to do that. And you, be, and you, and, and you will so enjoy yourself today. Hallelujah. You so enjoy yourself today. O over the past three weeks, we, we've learned, or four weeks, we've learned some interesting things about men who had every reason to be proud, but were humble. And others who had every reason to be humble, but were proud. You see the contrast, very interesting. And we had the opportunity of learning from the Lord Jesus himself and then his, his, some of his apostles and other mighty men in scripture. Tonight, we are zooming into the how, how to stay humble. And I want to share with us four scriptural ways of staying humble. But before that, I want to juxtapose humility and pride, you see, to lay a solid foundation for us to appreciate the conversation or the message today. So let's start off by juxtaposing humility and pride. Number one, you hear of pride and by nature, Satan is proud. So pride, it's not only um, an evil attribute. It's not only an attribute. It's actually a nature. a nature. It is a nature first before it's an attribute. So by nature, Satan is proud. Therefore, surprisingly, by actions, he's also very proud. And I want us to read Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17. Over there, I mean, from Ezekiel 28, from verse 12 down, we are introduced to Lucifer, or we are to, introduced to the anointed cherub, whom we now know as Satan. And God says something very interesting about this creature in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17. Today, my gift is not around, so... Um, as we project, I would also read from here. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17. And I want us to open our scriptures to that and then read. So um, the, the Spirit of God gave a word to Ezekiel about Lucifer. It starts from the verse 12, uh, verse 11, actually. I mean, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyros. And as you really know, the king of Tyros um, was not a human being, it was Lucifer there. And the verse 17, the Bible says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thine heart was lifted up because of thine beauty. So Satan was cast down from, from, from heaven, the presence of God, because of pride. And the same thing is elaborated in Isaiah chapter 14. When we read from the verse 12 to 15. Now look, listen to a creature talking and the authority with which he talks. Very amazing. 
Isaiah chapter 14, from verse 12 to 15, I will read from here again. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did wicked the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Whoa. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Whoa. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Then God came, but thou shalt be brought low to hell, to the size of the pit. Hallelujah. God had to show him his level. So by nature, he's proud. He became proud because of his beauty, the Bible says. He became proud because of his wisdom. He became proud because of the talent he possessed. And in the preceding weeks, I kept saying that you see, when, you don't, when, you, when you are not beautiful, you are not rich, you don't have all the education, it's so easy to say you are humble. But the real test of humility comes in when you have all these things. Would you still have the heart to be humble? When God placed all these beatitudes in Lucifer, Lucifer lost it. He became proud. So by nature, Satan is proud. And unfortunately, the pride and rebellion of Satan set a pattern on the earth. And so all men who tend to align with Satan tend to, tend to manifest these patterns, unfortunately. But the Bible says that God himself, because of God's experience with Lucifer, God himself opposes people who are proud. Now that's a serious statement. God himself opposes people who are proud. And I want us to read James chapter four from verse six to seven. And I, I, would, I would open up a very beautiful revelation. The Holy Spirit taught me just this evening along these lines to you. James chapter four from verse six to seven. So I will read from here. James four, six to seven. But he giveth grace, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but give grace, gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We should submit ourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Interestingly, the apostle Peter said the same thing. And the Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, every word is established. Let's read First Peter chapter 5. And I will be a little bit extensive. So we'll do from the verse 5 through to 9. First Peter 5, 5 through to 9. Peter is speaking here. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resisteth fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now, we learn two very interesting things from this scripture. The first is that, one, God resists the proud. And in both scriptures, the same word, the same Greek word is used or translated as resist. It's called antestemai. Antestemai. Antestemai actually means to stand up against. You see the way if somebody wants to bully you, you can stand up against the person, push the person back until the person gives up on you. Antestemai is, is like that. You stand up against, you become an opponent to the person. You, you, you fight the person. That's what God does to proud people. Whether you are a child of God or not a child of God, immediately you start manifesting the trait of pride. What happens is that you've taken on, you are manifesting the nature of the devil and God, God doesn't want to see it. God can suffer all sins, but the sin of pride, it's one that he hates to the core. And so it is the only occasion that God partners with the devil to discipline you. Because at Mary, it's the devil who is supposed to oppose you. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? However, immediately you begin to manifest the trait of pride. God shifts camp and joins with the devil. 
And look at what happens. In these two scriptures, we see that immediately the Bible talks about we being humble. The next one is we should resist the devil. In James 4, 6, 7, humble yourselves, resist the devil, and he will flee. The same thing is in Peter. Peter says that we should be watchful and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is roaring as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking who he may devour. So one of the things we learn from these two scriptures is that humility is actually a weapon of war against the devil. Should I cover again? Humility is a weapon of war against the devil. Honestly, I didn't know myself. It was this evening when I was meditating that the Holy Spirit drew my attention to the God friend. Do you see that immediately I, I talk about you submitting, the next one is resisting the devil. Because it is in submission to God, it is in humility that you actually begin to exercise the level of authority which resists the devil. Should I come again? You can unmute. Don't miss this one. Yeah, Pastor Josh, thank you. Humility is a weapon of war. It's a very effective weapon against the devil. When you walk in submission towards God, when you walk in submission towards the authorities God has placed you under, you be, you be you actually deploying a weapon of war. It's a weapon which is able to accurately resist the devil. It resists the devil. It's very, very powerful because pride is one of the major evil keys which allows Satan into your life. When you begin to walk in pride, you begin to manifest pride, you've opened a door to Satan. Satan will come and devour you. And God will not, God will not be there to help you because he himself is also opposing you. So then you become sandwiched between God and Satan. As God is opposing you, Satan is also devouring you. And that is why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter um. Um, 18 verse 16. I think this one we should read. Proverbs 18, 16. And I'll be, I'll be patient enough for Bishop Fred to project it. That's what the Bible says, that pride always comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Because if there is one sin which erodes your protection in the spirit, it is this evil sin called pride. So before any man will fall, before any man will come down, before any man will be destroyed, before any man will have whatever he owns comes crashing, it is because pride will have gone ahead. Pride erodes your spiritual defenses. Pride opens the door for Satan to come into your life and buffet you. But humility closes that door. Hallelujah. Humility closes that door. Humility shuts that door. Humility is a weapon you deploy and it resists the devil. It puts the devil to flight. That means that the, the category of Christians, Satan finds hardest to touch are Christians who have their mantle of humility on them all the time. I don't want you to miss me. I'm coming again. The category of Christians whom Satan finds hardest to touch are those who always have their mantle of humility on because humility is a protection and an insurance against the devil and his wiles. Hallelujah. So now, how do we become humble? Now, scripturally, there are many ways. But because of time, the exigency of time, I'm going to focus on just four of them. And I will give a very practical twist to this four. I'm not saying these are the only four. There are many. But for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on four. The first one, how to stay humble. And you want to take your notes from here. The first way of staying humble is number one, staying filled with the Holy Ghost all the time. Staying filled with the Holy Ghost all the time. And I want us to read Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 18 to 21. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. Staying filled with the Holy Ghost all the time. Now, practically, eh? A child of God becomes most vulnerable to yielding to pride when this child of God has neglected daily contact with the Lord for more than two days, I think. For more than two days. Of course, it depends on your level of fellowship with the Lord. 
But for the average Christian, I'm of the opinion that if you go for two days without prayer, if you go for two days without quality time with the Holy Spirit, you have actually stepped into the danger zone. And do not be drunk with wine. Where is this patient? But to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's go. Or maybe it's faster when I read from here. Ephesians 5. So he'll project, but I'll read from here. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and to the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. It's interesting. When you look at the narrative, it ends there. Then in the verse, the next verse, he starts talking about submission again, but this time within the family setting. So he was teaching about how to submit ourselves in the church. And before he came to this verse, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, he said, first be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without you being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to submit. Should I come again? God knows that. Our human nature is such that it is hard for us to submit. When you live in this body, this corrupted body, with all the influences of Satan in the air, it is hard to submit. But he gives us the way out. And the way out is that stay filled with the Holy Spirit. The people in the church who are able to submit to one another are those who are filled with the Holy Ghost. So before the Lord came to tell us to submit ourselves to one another, he said, but first be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And we know from this platform that the, one of the most practical ways of staying filled with the Holy Ghost on a daily basis is daily contact with the Lord, daily contact with the Lord. If you neglect your prayer life, if you neglect your closet life, you are drifting towards the danger zone. Yes, sometimes we go a day without prayer because we are tired, because of work schedule, because of all the pressure of work. But if you go two days without quality prayer, then the thing is becoming tensious, as Prophet Dr. Drew will say, they are a critical. They are a critical. But a sign you zoom into three days without prayer, you know what will happen? All the evil expressions of the flesh will begin to manifest. You will see that you begin to criticize people easily. You see that you begin to get angry easily. You see that you, you begin to lose faith. You begin to have a lot of doubt. You begin to tell people off. Because then the... The, the, the deeds and the desires of the flesh would have started manifesting. And once the flesh begins to gain ascendancy over the spirit, it's so easy to drift into the realm of pride where you see yourself as all knowing, all correct, all perfect, and everyone else is the problem, but not you. But the, 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 the insight God gives us is that I know it is difficult to submit, God knows, because we live in a, in a fallen world. But he tells us, first, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so you do not have to neglect your daily contact with the Lord. It's a must. I keep saying this. And on this platform, I've thought extensively that Christo Nippardi, Christo Nippardi, if we are going by the standards of God, minimum one hour a day, you have to, you have to do it. We don't pray for minimum one hour a day. The tendency will be so strong. But if you're able to do this on a consistent basis, it comes like it, it suppresses the desires of the flesh and your spirit is always in the ascendancy. And prayer, prayer stirs up the Holy Ghost. And so you will find that all the time you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you are therefore able 
to submit. Hallelujah. So the first point is a practical, easy practical point, is to stay filled with the Holy Ghost every day. And I'm saying that one of the easiest ways or the most practical ways of staying filled with the Holy Ghost is daily contact with the Lord in prayer. Daily contact with the Lord in prayer. Pray before you go to work or pray before you sleep. Make it mandatory. Hallelujah. This expression we use, Holy Spirit, I yield unto you, is a guiding expression of the Christian walk. It's true. If you are too powerful to depend on the Holy Spirit in the church, then you are too big for God's camp. God will kick you out. Because in God's camp, everybody is led by the Spirit. When you are led by the Spirit, it's so easy to submit to everybody and anybody. I hear of Christians who are complaining about the apostles, criticizing their apostles. And I just know as a pastor over the years that's because they are not, they are not filled with the Holy Ghost. The Christians are not filled with the Holy Ghost. The Christians, they do not pray before they go to work. Because if you pray before you go to work, even if your boss is a devil, you'll still be able to submit to your boss. Prayer provokes the expression of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and gets us filled so that we can submit. Number two, the two, second practical way of staying humble is to be deaf, to be deaf to the praises of men. Please, I hope you heard me. Be deaf to the praises of men. It's a training you must give yourself. Let's kindly read John chapter two from verse 23 to 25. A very interesting account is given there. John chapter 2, from verse 23 to 25. It's the account of Jesus visiting Jerusalem to minister for the first time after his baptism. The Bible reads, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man because he knew what was in man. Very interesting account. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem, does a lot of miracles, great things, preaches incredible words. And right after the people begin to sing his praises, they begin to desire him more. They begin to make him feel like his kind has not come on earth before. But the Bible says Jesus did not commit himself unto them. He means just not pay attention to the words they were speaking. Why? Because he knew men. He knew what was in men. And therefore, he didn't know anybody to lecture him about the praises of men. The praises of men. If as a young person growing up, you do not train yourself to be deaf to the praises of men, and you depend on the compliments and the accolades and all the expressions of you are good, you are the best I've ever seen, you make those words into your head. Know that you are on the way to destruction. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 26. And I would want us to read from either the Amplified Version or the NLT, Luke 6, 26. Either the Amplified Version or the NLT. I hope that um, Fred can give us that. I'm also trying to pull it from here. Luke 6, 26. The Amplified Version, or NLT, gives a very interesting rendition or rendering to it. So just is speaking here. Just is speaking here. He says, I'm reading the NLT. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? <laughs> for the ancestors also praised false prophets. Jesus says, if you are a man, eh, and you are always praised by the crowds, so awaits you. Let's see the Amplified Version too. The Amplified Version too is very interesting, the way it is rendered. What sorrow awaits you if you are always praised by the crowd? The Amplified Version. I can read the Amplified Version from here. So the Amplified Version reads, Woe to you when all the people speak well of you and praise you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Jesus says that if you are somebody who is always praised by men, you are already in danger. 
It's a woe. And so it is wisdom not to give your ears to the praises of men. You need to train yourself to be deaf or deafened to the praises of men. Because the praises of men often make you feel, I mean, like it, it makes you see yourself beyond who you really are. And it puts you right on a negative track to the path of destruction. So Jesus said that it is a curse. War is a curse. War means cursed be unto. So it is a curse. If you are a person, you are in a system and everybody in the system is praising you. You don't have at least one person who can stand up to challenge your opinions. You don't have at least one person who can look at you in the eyes and say that what you are doing, I don't think is the right thing. And everybody is bowing and kotoing to you. You are in danger. You see, in the African charismatic system, at least we come from Ghana, so you can appreciate what I'm trying to say here. You, you cannot share a contrary opinion to the pastor. Everything the pastor says is the right thing. And if you are within the church system or within the system and you hold opinions contrary to that of the pastor, you are seen as an enemy. Everybody in the church should praise the pastor. Right? Or both where everybody should agree with it and celebrate don't you see why our pastors are becoming demigods? It's so clear. When you, when, you, when, you, when you come to this part of the world, you see ministers in this part of the world, and you go to Africa and you see just Africa, the difference eh, is irreconcilable. You can't compare. It's the same between the politicians. If you look at European politicians, and you look at African politicians, it, it's amazing, you can't compare. Look at a place like Sweden, Sweden. Members of parliament in Sweden, eh? Teachers in Sweden are paid more than members of parliament in Sweden. Like if Pastor Josh or Pastor Evelyn were in Sweden, like by now they are, they are just, like, I mean, you would not want to leave your job for politics because politicians are the least paid. And they are seen as very normal people. Nobody is going to buy a lead for you, no. If the government wants to buy a VA, the government will buy the VA, a VA for the teacher, not the politician. It's, it's the exact reverse. People who are in offices who are supposed to serve the people, they suddenly become like demigods in their worship. And you cannot correct them. Everything they say, is it, and they want to always hear the praises of men. I pray that God delivers us from all, all of us from this. Hallelujah. The thing is that um, the praises of men, okay, do not always mean divine endorsement. And that was what Jesus was trying to draw their attention to. The praises of men do not always mean divine endorsement. They do not necessarily correlate all the time. So the fact that everybody is celebrating you, the fact that crowd are singing your praises, is by no means a, like an endorsement of heaven over your ministry or the, what you are preaching to be true. It is deep. What I'm telling you is very deep. I may have to repeat myself here. Now, if you're a minister, okay, or wherever you are, and all the people in your church are praising you, they are, you are this, you are powerful. When they see you, now, I said, I was here, tear guam also, and they virtually want to lie prostrate before you and all that. Everybody is praising you. You are doing well. It does not mean that God is in agreement with what you are preaching and what you are doing. They are two different things altogether. They do not always correlate, even though sometimes they will correlate. But the truth of scripture is that anytime a minister is really doing the work of God, the minister faces opposition. In fact, when a minister is ascending in the spirit, the minister tends to be criticized more than praised. So Jesus won't go if all men praise you. It means you are not doing too well, be sure. I mean, be, know, know about that. Hallelujah. And uh, within the football circles, for instance, sometimes I just put my hands here. I say, hey, and they, these journalists will kill this young talent. Especially in Britain. A young talent, 17, 18, 19 year old footballer comes up, a British footballer comes up, plays one, two, three games. And then you would hear from the uh, sports journalist, he, he's unplayable. He's probably the greatest to have ever arisen. He's, 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 they, they start comparing you to some of the greats. And oftentimes he eats into their head and in no time they are down. Jesus said we should be deaf to the praises of men. Know what, what is in man. Men are sacrifices. 
men are charlatans, most. They are doing it for their individual gains. They are praising you because they want something from you. It's not because you are good. And you should know that. So you have to um, possess this mindset of the Lord. Don't commit yourself to men. Now, I know Rhoda is online and Kevin is online. And I was, <laughs> you know, over the years, even in Fanet, I've trained myself to be deaf to the praises of men. Me, my whole life, I mean, when you say all that nice things about me, I don't remember after a few minutes. Now, sometimes when I'm done ministering at camp or NOS or wherever, then you will hear Stefan. General Steph and Rhoda and Anna, they will put on their exaggeration ropes, if I can put it that way. They will put on their ropes as administration. When they come and they are talking to me about how the administration went, I mean, like, they will give you a thousand and one reasons why you are a real preacher. They think your kind is not on it. And, and this, and it went, and I, and I mean, the words you spoke and proper, the depth and the revelation. When they are talking in my mind, eh, I'll be going like, Oh, mo, na lie. See this one, so they want to kill me before my time. Huh? Move, recycle bin, delete permanently. They are talking. They think they are talking and they are they are convincing me. I'm there. I'm laughing and oh, I'm just oh, mo, you want to kill me? No, control out, delete out, out, out. And by the time I'm done talking with them, I don't remember all the nice things they said. I've trained myself. Because if Rhoda Punchin is around you and you open your ears to all the nice things, it's not like she does it deliberately. That's her personality. You know, you know something moves her and with the words, press herself and talk. Uh, please, don't go more. When they are talking, close your ears. The worst in this category is Kevin Cleland, our MC for today. The words Kevin can use. I don't know whether he studies the Oxford Dictionary. He would dip and use some expressions and the passion with which he would speak. Papa, the word I mean, I was. When Kevin is talking, I go like, see, oh, he has put on the oil of exaggeration. <laughs> Omo run away from this man. Hallelujah. I mean, on a lighter note. But it's true. They know it. And sometimes Kevin will be talking and I say, Master Shatu, it's okay. Pause here. I said I was going to Kaswa. I didn't say I will continue to Kanish because I'm guarding myself against letting the presence of men eat into me. There's a sure path to destruction. Hallelujah. The third one, the third point. Is somebody being blessed? You can unmute. Oh. I want to make it so practical. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Pastor. Please don't. <laughs> Don't join the Exaggeration Association led by Stefan Duncan Roda Kunsi and Abufie <laughs> Efriye and then Kevin Cleland. When they start talking, just close your ears and then say, oh, no. I, don't want, I don't want to die before my time. Go, delete. Recycle bit so that the words they speak do not eat you up and you begin to feel like you are the best who has come. It is never true. There is nothing you are preaching which has not been preached before. <laughs> There's nothing you are saying, which is the first time, which is being told. It's a lie. Anybody, when you're a preacher and people come around, they, they want you to feel like the revelations and insight you are sharing there, you are the greatest of our generation, please. It's a lie. Mm. Third one. Let's turn our Bible to Philippians chapter 2. And we would read from the verse 5 through to maybe 9 or 12. Philippians 2. Verse 5 through to 9 or 12. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Then a column comes. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Then a column comes. It means that everything which follows is an elaboration of this statement. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So he starts explaining who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name, by the name of Jesus, every should bow and every thought of things in heaven 
in the earth and under the earth and everything should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Hallelujah. The third point is that do not be too much into your reputation. Do not be too much into your reputation. Do not be too drawn into your reputation. Now, in this narrative, we are invited to possess the same mindset as the Lord Jesus. But what was the Lord Jesus' mindset, which we are invited to possess? The Bible says that even though he was God, he made himself of no reputation. That's the mindset. I'm coming again. In this narrative, we are told to possess the same mindset as the Lord Jesus. And what is this mindset the Bible is talking about? It is this mindset that even though he was God, he made himself of no reputation. Now, all the other things we read about, which happened to him, were consequences of deliberately putting on this mindset. And even though I am God, I make myself of no reputation. And when he decided to make himself of no reputation, he could become a man. That's a condescension. When God becomes a man, that's humiliation, condescension. He became a bond servant, further condescension, because among men, the least regarded are born servants. And he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And that is the most humiliating death, because among all deaths, the most humiliating is a death on the cross. So it means that he couldn't have been humble if he had worked with a consciousness of his reputation as God. There is somebody with me. You can unmute and respond if you are getting the point I'm making. Yes, Pastor. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes I need uh-huh. such feedback from you. If he had worked with a consciousness that he's an engineer, he couldn't have become what he became. If he had worked about with a consciousness that he's a doctor, with a consciousness that he's a corporate manager, he could not have fulfilled purpose. One of the biggest barriers which causes us to be inflicted in ego and eventually become proud is that when we walk about, even to our washrooms, we walk with our reputation. We go there with our titles. We go there with our accolades and our sins. To the extent that for the men, sometimes you think towards their own wives. And even worse, the women, even towards their own husbands, they go home with their reputation. The Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation. What does that mean? It means he emptied himself. He stripped himself of the consciousness of his greatness, the consciousness of his importance, the consciousness of his riches. It means that he gave up what he had in terms of consciousness. He gave up what he cherished. He gave up what he recognized as dignified. He emptied himself as a king and took the form of a servant. It's a mindset. That's what the Bible is teaching here. It is to strip yourself of all glories and deliberately and consciously train yourself to recognize that the despite where God has lifted you, you are still a man. And be ready to do the mundane things, the banal things, the ordinary things of life without feeling that this is below me now. Now, the Lord Jesus, uh, he was very strategic in his communication. Jesus said something very profound in Luke chapter 17, from verse 7 to 10. Now, when you read that scripture, I hit you hard, but he says that's the mindset which you possess. And after the Lord gave me insight into walking about without your reputation, or making yourself of no reputation, I could better appreciate why the Lord Jesus taught his disciples this scripture in Luke chapter 17 from verse 7 to 10. Very interesting account. He says, here he's speaking to his apostles. And he tells them, which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, 
when he is come from the field, go and sit down to eat meat. I will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and get yourself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk him, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I throw not. So likewise, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. This is hard meat. This is strong meat. Jesus is saying this. After doing your best for God, after doing your best for the kingdom, when in your closet you are reporting to him, present yourself as an unprofitable servant. Does not this kick against our ego? An unprofitable servant has no reputation. An unprofitable servant just recognizes himself or herself as a bond servant. Pastor Josh's message, bond servant, those of us who were at junior camp that year. I'm a bond servant. I've only done what I was supposed to do. You see, that way, when the praises of men begin to come, trying to let you think that you have done what no other man on earth has ever done before, it doesn't eat you up. It doesn't get into you because you possess the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. You make yourself of no reputation despite who you are. So despite all that I may have achieved as a servant, when I go before my Lord, I present myself as an unprofitable servant. Who is an unprofitable servant? The servant who did what he was asked to do. <laughs> There's somebody with me. There is nothing you will do which can impress God. There is no man on earth who can live up to God's standards. It's not possible, not even in the new creation. So he says, after all that we have done, see yourself as a servant who just did what he was supposed to do. You don't go about bragging. You don't go about saying all the things about what you've achieved. Now with this eye, you would, you would now begin to appreciate the danger in some of the communications we hear from some of our great men. They talk about the things they have done, the things they've accomplished, and it works with them. That reputation works with them. It's not a blessing. Jesus says that after all that we have done, we should see ourselves as unprofitable servants. When you work with that reputation of a servant like the Lord Jesus did, then you will be free to do the ordinary things. You're free to do the banal things. You will not think anything is too low for you to do because of your status. Hallelujah. Remember this. Even God, when he became man, washed the feet of his servants. But how could he stoop so low? It was because he made himself of no reputation. Jesus did not walk about on earth with the mindset of his God. If he walked about on earth with the mindset of he was God, he would not do such a banal thing as washing the feet of his servants. But he could gladly do those very ordinary and banal things of life because he made himself of no reputation. This is tough. This teaching I'm giving you is tough. <laughs> you see? And <laughs> it, it requires grace to be able to to, to achieve so much and still be so plain and still possess the mindset of a servant. Because in our world, when you achieve so much, the world gives you the mindset of a king and you begin to exact over others. But may the Lord help us in this regard. I want to relate Pastor Papa Adiboye's story to you. One day he was asked, but just this August, August 2021, at one of the the, I mean, the biggest conference of redeemed, one of them, I think, in, in uh, Nigeria, he was speaking. And so he was addressing the issue of why he, 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 he had been used by God to achieve all that he had achieved, and yet was so humble. What way has the biggest church, or pastors, the biggest church in the world? He sits over one million every Sunday. And then he said this, I quote, but why won't I be humble? I will remind you of what happened after Lekki 98, one of the biggest programs we ever held. We came back here at night 
I was out praising God for the mighty things he had done between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I knew the spot where I was. He said, son, bend down quickly. I bent down. And he said, draw the figure of a man in the sand. Quickly, I did. And he said, stand up. I did. He said, wipe out what you have drawn with your leg. I did. He said, son, if you ever forget who is the one in charge, I will wipe you out and nobody will ever remember you came into this world. Please, did you hear that? You can yes, only respond. Fair. So that was Papa Adiboye speaking in August. People were people. People wanted to know why he was so humble, and he said, "God told him in 1998 after one of the biggest crusades that if you ever forget who is in charge, he asked him to draw the figure of a man in the sand with his fingers. He did, and afterwards, God asked him to clean the figure with his." Um, Feet and he did, and then God told him, If you ever forget who is in charge here, <laughs> I'll wipe you out like you have wiped out this figure you drew, and nobody will remember you ever existed. I mean, this story will never be our story in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The last one, the last point, please, Auntie Abena, please, today give me a few minutes more. Okay, I'm ending the show. So it looks like I'm. I will need the, uh, the maybe five minutes more. So please give me five minutes more. I'm yeah. trying to Yes, tie. Pastor. That's why I love you. Abby. That's why I love you. Thank you so much. So the last point is number four. Learn to esteem others better than you. Today I'm teaching strong. They, they are simple meat, but they are strong to do. Learn to esteem others better than you. It's one of the surest ways of staying humble. Let's read Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians 2, 3. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. I'm not the one saying this. I'm waiting for Bishop Fred to project. And Fred, when you project, stay there. Because this is tough. In the competitive environment we are born into, our egos will not permit us to esteem others better than us. We, we are trained, it's sad, but I mean, even in the church, it's almost as if we are trained to wish the downfall of others so that we, would, we alone will be seen as the most successful. And it's a problem, it's in the church. We have a lot of competition in the church. We want to outdo each other in the church. We want to outdo each other at the workplace. Because the systems of the world tell us to be, be, be able to present ourselves in that regard so that everybody will see us as the most spectacular. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other they let each esteem others better than himself. And I'm saying it's tough. It's tough. In this my short life, I've seen something experiential. I've seen from experience uh, that when you learn to accept that there are many people out there who may be better than you at what you do, despite all the praises that people around you are showering on you, if you possess a mindset that there are people who are out there who are better than you, it really helps you to open up to learn, to submit, and to really stay humble. It takes pressure off you. You don't walk about thinking you are the best ever who has come on the scene. It's, it's not that on the mindset of heaven. The mindset of heaven is for us to, to see others better than us. So in every, every zone, wherever you go, when people begin to praise you, Refer them to somebody who is better than you. Deflect their attention from yourself and point them to somebody you believe is better than you. And I do it all the time. Everywhere I have been to, 
when I have ministered the word and I've been a blessing, and people begin to come to me and say wonderful things, the first question I ask them, do you know Dr. Jordi Fadasa? And often they will say like, no, we don't know him. And I say, ah, go and look for him on YouTube. He is my times 10. That's how I deflect. When I was in Ghana, I was doing the same thing. I go and preach and people come, uh, they start talking. I say, but have you listened to Dr. George? They go and listen to Dr. George. He is, he is a higher grade of me. He's a higher version of me. And that's the truth. Absolute truth. So I point them to somebody who is better than me. And it takes the pressure off me. It takes, it takes every tendency to begin to see yourself as better than everyone else of you. And it keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. Hallelujah. It keeps you humble. So it is divine wisdom. And this is not complex. Even though practically it's quite difficult to manifest. It's simple. God says that count others as more significant than yourself. It's tough, but that's what he demands. He says that consider others as more important than yourself. He says that consider others as better than yourself. He says that this is a manifestation of humility. You see, it was after saying this thing that Apostle Paul came back to say that we should have this mindset, which was in the Lord Jesus. This one kicks against our competitive nature as a people. Yet this is the divine prescription to live in a humble life. So in conclusion, I want to reiterate the four things in this series we have been taught to practically practice so that we would stay humble. The first is never to, never to neglect our daily contact with the Lord. Never neglect your closest life. The second, be deaf to the praises of men. Do not draw your motivation for life from the praises of men because they have a way of fueling your ego in the, right, in the wrong direction. The third is to possess the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, learn to be less mindful of your reputation and achievements and all that in life. And last but not the least, is to train yourself to think and see others as better than yourself in whatever you do although the world will teach you otherwise. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, selfless canter her deference to the As you do this, as you walk in this light, may the Holy Spirit of God honor his word over your life. May God gives, give you grace, greater grace, because the word says that God gives grace to the humble. As you walk in meekness, as you walk in humility, as you put these into practice, may the grace of God be amplified by your life. May the grace of God be magnified by your life. May the grace of God be outpoured towards you in quantitative measures, great measures, the type of measure that every space you enter into, men will see that a man with a difference has penetrated this space. I pray that the literal presence of God will be your daily expression as you walk with this understanding, as you practicalize these insights of scripture in the name of our Lord Jesus. I ask that the spirit of God will continually brood over you. The grace of God will continually be expressive over your life and everywhere you go, when men see you, they will encounter the true nature of Christ. They will encounter the vital expression of divinity. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the Lord increase the grace upon his grace upon your life in manifold proportions. May he endow you with the choicest insights of his word. Because in you, he finds a faithful steward. In you, he finds a faithful steward, a faithful apostle, a faithful prophet, a faithful and a humble evangelist, a man whose heart will draw men unto him. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the Lord lift you up according to his word, because Jesus said, whoever humbles himself shall be lifted up. And I know the word of my God is true. He said that his word is ever settled in heaven. Not a word would fail. He said if you humble yourself, he himself would elevate you. May the Lord elevate you. May the Lord lift you up. May the Lord cause you to rise only as you walk in humility from today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may he expand you beyond your wildest imaginations. 
get to places you never envisioned you would get to, penetrate corridors you never envisioned you would penetrate, encounter men you never envisioned you'd encounter. These are men sent from God. These are doors and corridors and openings which have been opened up unto you by God. By reason of your humility, may the grace of God define your life. May the grace of God be inundated in grace. Be inundated in grace and become the epitome, the epitome, the epitome, the perfect example in our generation. The testimony of Moses your testimony from today. It will be said wherever you go that you are the most humble. A man who attracts men, attracts favor from both God and men because you walk in absolute humility. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and release angels to serve you as you put on your mantle of humility on a daily basis. Let angels serve you. Let angels serve you. Let angels be at your call in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let men serve you. Let men serve you. Let men be at your call in the name of the Lord Jesus. And let the response of heaven to your request be with speed. Because a man with a mantle of humility, the sign of authority in the spirit has called in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord bless you. And may this word you have heard produce results in your spirit in the coming days and weeks and months and years. And let your life be the example God has determined it to be. In the precious and majestic name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.